Hello, today I'm going to take a look at a brand new AIO from Sahara Gaming. It's the EX360. First thing I'm going to be doing is showing you how to install it, and I'm going to do that in my personal system behind me. Then what I'm going to do is test it out and see if it's any good. Okay, first thing to do is to get the fans onto the radiator. So I'm going to go ahead and set the fans on the radiator, making sure the cables are coming out at the back. Then we can go ahead and use the long radiator screws from the I.O. to secure the fans to the radiator. Coming from each of the fans, we've got two wires. One of them is a standard four pin fan connector and the other is a Sahara Gaming RGB connector. Starting off with the four pin fan connectors, we do get a triple fan splitter cable with the I.O. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug each of the four pin fan connectors into the fan splitter cable. Okay, so now we've just got a single four pin fan connector that we can go ahead and plug into the CPU fan header on our motherboard. The AIO comes with an ARGB controller, so I'm going to plug the other wire coming from the AIO into channels number one, two, and three. We've got two cables coming from the pump. One is a standard three pin fan connector, which is going to go into our pump header on the motherboard. The other is exactly the same RGB connector coming from the fans, so I'm going to go ahead and plug it into channel number four on our hub. Taking a look at the hub in a little bit more detail, you can see we've actually still got six Aspire RGB connectors. Coming from the top of the hub, we've got a standard SATA power cable, which we're going to need to plug into a cable coming from our power supply to power the hub. On the front of the hub, we've got some buttons to control LED speed, mode, and fan speed. On the bottom of the hub, we've got two connectors. One is labeled data, and we're gonna to have to plug an extra cable into it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and plug this extra cable that comes with the I.O. And then coming from this cable, we've got two RGB connectors. This is a standard three pin, five volt addressable RGB connector. And then we've got one that you would use on gigabyte motherboards. There's also a standard four pin PWM fan connector, which you'll plug into your motherboard. The other connector at the bottom of the hub is labeled reset switch. And what you can actually do, rather than plugging the case cable coming from your case into the header on your motherboard to allow it to have reset switch functionality, you can instead plug it into this hub. Then when you press the reset switch on your case, it's gonna cycle through the different RGB effects. Using the data cable at the bottom is optional and you're only going to need to use it if you want to allow your motherboard to control the lighting on the fans and the pump itself. If you're happy enough to use the buttons on the controller to cycle through the different effects, there's no need to use this cable. The other nice thing that Sahara Gaming included is a remote control, which is going to control the hub as well. Next thing to do is to add a bracket to our pump, which is going to help secure it to the motherboard. The kit comes with two different brackets. We've got one for AMD, and one for Intel. I'll show you the Intel one first. So all you would need to do is slide it in at the side here and push it into place. And that's the Intel one secured. I'm going to install this in an AMD motherboard, so I'm going to go ahead and remove this one. We install the AMD one in exactly the same way, so we'll go ahead and line things up and push into place. Okay, we're now ready to get this installed onto the motherboard. This is the back plate we're going to need to use for the I.O. You can see one side is labelled AMD, and if I turn it over, this other side is labelled Intel. As I'm going to be installing this on an AMD motherboard, an AM4 socket, I'm going to need to have it with the AMD text facing the way. The first thing for us to do is to put this little gasket on. It's got some double-sided tape. Let's go ahead and remove that. Line this up with the cutout and then we can set it into place. The next thing for us to do is to go ahead and insert these long screws through the back plate. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the back plate upside down. 
And it's these brackets here that we're going to actually want to use for AMD. These longer, thinner ones are for Intel motherboards. Now, looking at the bracket, we have got two different holes on each corner. What we're going to want to do is insert the screw through the holes closest to the middle of the bracket. So down here, we're going to put it through this one and this one here. Now, you'll notice whenever they go through, the screws are sitting loose, but if we turn the screws round, at one point it will lock into place and then it won't turn anymore. So same thing for here. That's it, it's just fitted through and that's it locked into place. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn things over. Next thing to do is to fit one of these little plastic gaskets over each of the screws. Look at the little gasket itself. There's one flat side and there's one side with a little lip. The side with the little lip needs to go up the way because it's going to fit through the holes in the motherboard. And then again, I'm just going to make sure all the screws are pulled in and won't turn anymore. So that one's pulled in, push the gasket down. That's that one now locked in. And there we go. So that's all the screws locked into place. We're now able to insert this into the back of the motherboard. So I've already gone ahead and removed the back plate from this AMD motherboard. So all I need to do now is line the back plate up with the holes in the back and we can simply push things into place. Next we can go ahead and insert another plastic gasket over the top of the screw and again this time making sure the flat end is facing up the way. Then we can go ahead and put one of these hexagonal nuts over each of the screws and tighten it up by hand. Next I'm going to go ahead and get our radiator secured at the top of the case. Then I can go ahead and slide this bracket into the top of the case. Next I'm going to take all the cables coming from the fans into the back of the case. Then I'm going to go ahead and bring our 4-pin PWM fan splitter cable and plug it into our CPU fan header at the top of the motherboard. If you are wanting to use your motherboard to control the fans, as we've mentioned, you'll need to plug the additional data cable into one of your RGB connectors on your motherboard. So I've got a 3-pin 5-volt ARGB connector here in the top of the motherboard. I'm going to go ahead and line it up with the cable coming from the controller and push things into place and again pull the excess cable through to the back. Next we just need to add a pea-sized amount of thermal paste to the centre of the CPU. Just before we insert the I.O. there's going to be some plastic protection from the cold plate that we're going to have to remove. Then we can go ahead and line the bracket up then there's four little washers to pass over the top of each of the screws. And then we've got a spring nut for each of the corners. Then I'm just going to go ahead and plug the 3-pin fan connector cable coming from the pump into our pump fan header. The other cable coming from the pump is for RGB and I'm just going to fit it through to the back of the case. Then to complete our installation at the back of the case, all we need to do is plug each of the RGB connectors coming from the fans and also coming from the pump head into the RGB hub. Then all we need to do is power our hub. I've got a spare SATA connector coming from our power supply here which I'm going to go ahead and plug into. And then I'm just going to go ahead and tuck the hub in at the bottom out of the way.
So as you can see, installing the I.O. was fairly straightforward. There was a couple of wee things I wasn't so keen on. One of them was, I think, the mounting bracket for installing your cooler onto the motherboard was a little cumbersome to install. There was quite a few components in that, and I think if you were installing your first I.O., it would be a little bit more confusing than some of the other ones. On the plus side, however, you do have four mounting points on the motherboard, so hopefully you're going to get a really good contact with your CPU, rather than a lot of the other coolers where there's two mounting points, and quite often they'll use the standard motherboard brackets. Maybe the other thing I wasn't so keen on was how everything connects up. I think if you're going to use the controller, it's very good. There's a lot of nice colour effects on it, and there's a nice remote control which you can use as well to cycle through them. If you do want to connect this up to your motherboard, what a lot of other AIOs will do is they will give you a separate cable, so you're not having to use the included controller. Unfortunately with this AIO, whether you want to connect it to the motherboard or not, you are going to have to use their included controller, which is quite a bulky item to fit at the back of your case. So it would have been nice to have seen one option of using the controller, and a second option, a separate cable that you can just plug into the motherboard, not needing any controller, and making the whole process of cable management at the back of the case that little bit easier. Okay, so now we come on to the important bit. How well did the cooler perform? So I'm going to compare it against the cooler I had in the case prior to this, which was BeQuat's Pure Loop 330 with Lian Li's Uni fans on the radiator. The reason I was using the Lian Li Uni fans is that the Pure Wings 2 high speed fans that came with that AIO were too loud for my liking. With that particular configuration, I was fairly happy with how the system performed. So taking a look at the temperatures, it is important to mention I had a Ryzen 9 5900X in the system. So with our Sahara Gaming EX360, our CPU idled at 34 degrees, which was one degree hotter than using the Pure Loop. During the 20 minute IDA64 stability test, our CPU reached a maximum temperature of 86 degrees, which was three degrees cooler than using the Pure Loop. Taking a look at the noise levels, our EX360 was four decibels quieter than the Pure Loop at idle. However, during the IDA64 stability test, it was the opposite way round, with the EX360 being five decibels louder at 52 decibels. The one thing that was, however, really noticeable during the thermal testing is that the temperature displayed on the AIO itself is incredibly inaccurate. You can see at the moment it's displaying 26 degrees, but we know from the thermal testing using IDA64 and the CPU diode temperature, the lowest the CPU will actually idle is 33 degrees. So this is quite a bit away from this. When we were actually running the stress test, the differences were even larger. The highest the temperature displayed on the AIO actually went up to was 39 degrees. However, we know the CPU diode temperature actually reached 89 degrees, which is quite a difference. Now there's no actual software, the AIO doesn't actually connect to the motherboard to get the temperature from the motherboard. It actually must have a sensor in it itself and that's what it's displaying. So obviously this is one of the big features of the AIO, but I'm not actually sure how useful the temperature displayed actually is, given how far away it is from the actual real CPU temperature. So putting everything together, would I recommend you go out and get this AIO? Well, I think the first thing to consider is the AIO is actually fairly reasonable priced for a 360mm version. As well, Sahara Gaming are hopefully going to be sending me a promotional code that you're going to be able to use to get a significant discount. Once I have the code, you'll find it in the description together with the link to the cooler. So that's the first thing to consider. This is actually a fairly budget priced AIO, particularly for a 360mm version. The other important thing to consider is that it actually does a fairly good job at cooling at reasonable noise levels. I have mentioned there was a few things I was less keen on. One of the major ones I think is the backplate is a little bit fiddly to fit. And I suppose that the number being displayed on the screen, which is one of the AIO's main functions, is highly inaccurate. And looking at it, that would actually frustrate me a little bit. So I think you're going to have to weigh everything up. If you are on a tight budget, I think this is a good option because you're going to get a good looking cooler that does a great job and not cost you an awful lot of money. However, if you're somebody like me who having an inaccurate CPU temperature on full display is going to be driven absolutely mad by it and you do have a little bit more money to spend, 
you might be better taking a look elsewhere. Particularly if they had given the option just to turn the CPU temperature off, I think I could have overlooked this, but there doesn't seem to be an option to do that. So I think for Sahara Gaming's first AIO, it's definitely a good first effort. And hopefully when they look at some of the feedback, um, the second version of the cooler will come with an option to display an accurate CPU temperature based on software rather than a sensor built into the AIO. So hopefully you find the review useful. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.